a colleague of mine and a really good friend of mine, Dr. Jim Zogby. Uh, I'll give you a brief uh, uh, overview of Jim. Jim is um, originally from New York, in the Utica area, went to undergraduate in Lemoyne, and then came here and, and found a life, came to Philadelphia and did his PhD at uh, Temple University. So uh, I always like bringing Jim, and it's easy for me to bring Jim to this area because he loves Philadelphia. Jim then went a little bit around the country, uh, taught at uh, Shippensburg, see? remember that? And then went to DC and founded various Arab American organizations. He was one of the founders of the uh, Palestinian Human Rights Campaign, the American Arab um, Anti-Discrimination <coughs> uh, Committee, and since the early 80s, he's been running an organization called the Arab American Institute which is the, probably the preeminent Arab American think tank uh, and organization in the city. But he does much more than that. And he's done some real interesting uh, work with his brother John on public opinion polling throughout the Arab world and, and the United States. You may have heard of his brother John Zogby of Zogby Polls. <clears throat> what we're going to be hearing today is some really interesting uh, polling data and, and research that Jim has done on Arab attitudes toward Iran, and it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, we will also have the opportunity afterwards to have our, our own little discussion. Anybody wants to, we have a lot of questions, but then if you can personally talk to Jim, and Jim has a couple of his books here for sale. They're really e-books, but I don't do e-books, so I, he, he printed a couple. So they're uh, for sale for only $10. So with no further ado, Jim, Thank or you Dr. James Zog. No, I've much much years. better. <laughs> I got to put this on, right? Um, thank you. I'd say thank you all for coming, but it's a credit thing, right? So you have to, you have to, you have to, you know, had to be here. Do you, think, do you think attendance? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, all right, I'll do it the right way. No, I'll just put it, all right, it'll look weird, but. <coughs> Don't notice this, okay? Is, there, is the sound okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Marwan, and thank you for coming. Uh, this is a, a project that I um, could get a little dry because it's numbers and polling data, but I want to start by explaining why we did it and why it was important and maybe give some context to the, the numbers so that you can appreciate a little of uh, the, the, the importance of, of, of what we're doing. When their policy discussions take place in the U.S. about Iran, it exclusively talks about Iran and Israel. Uh, Israel is threatened, the U.S. <coughs> is threatened, and Israel is threatened, and Israel is threatened, and that's the conversation. Uh, we're supplying Israel with new this and new that. Today, the, the, some Osprey helicopters and some refueling planes and new fighter jets and, and smart bombs, et cetera, and bunker buster bombs uh, to go after uh, Iran's, uh, give them the capability of going after Iran's nuclear program um, as if uh, that were a solution to anything or as if that were something that actually would make the region more stable and peaceful. The reality is, is that Iran is not a threat to Israel. Um, Iran's threat is across the water. It is to the Arabs. That is Iran's target and historically has always been where Iran's goal has been, to be the leader of the revolution that changes the Arab world. Um, from the earliest days, I mean, in the beginning, before the Iranian revolution, during the days of the Shah, the role of Iran, and when Iran saw itself as the hegemonic power that would dominate the Gulf region uh, and become um, the go-to address for anything that happened in that area. With the Iranian revolution, it took on a different dimension. It took on the, the dimension of a revolution, not unlike um, the, the Maoist revolution. I mean, there was a cultural revolutionary aspect to it. People who had contrary ideologies were purged, but it also was a revolution that was going to export itself. And, and uh, almost from the very beginning, they were uh, sending groups to Saudi Arabia, to the Hajj, to create 
disturbances of one sort or another, um, to project the fact that, that we were, the, in Iran, the leader of the revolution, and we were going to challenge the leaders of these Arab countries and show them to be lackeys of the West. They were not the, the true Muslims who were going to fight for real progressive change um, in the region. One of the ways that Iran projected itself as the, the leader of the revolution and the opposition to the West and the counterforce to the regimes was by showing the, the regimes to be weak and to always solely, sort of falling uh, victim to whatever the dictates of the West were. Um, this went on for, for years and years and years, and Iran cultivated allies, um, certainly allies among the Shia faith, which Iran was, but also allies among revolutionary groups, um, some religious-based, some not, um, who were also groups who were challenging the leaders of, of, of different Arab countries. Um, in, in different ways, um, I think, let me jump forward 20 or so years to the beginning of this century where Iran's favorable ratings across the Arab world were fairly high. Fairly high because people saw them as, um, as in fact, uh, the answer. Uh, our regimes are doing nothing. We're being humiliated by America. America invades Iraq, and what do our regimes do? Nothing. Uh, Israel is attacking the Palestinians, and what do our regimes do? Nothing. Now, the Arabs had fought a long war with Iran when, if you know the map, Iraq, which was always called the gateway to the Arab world, borders on Iran and fought a long, bitter war, eight years and maybe a million casualties. It was brutal, and it exhausted both countries. And actually, the United States played both sides against each other, um, and we were not uncomfortable with these two governments, neither of whom we liked, going at each other. Arabs saw Saddam, despite their lack of appreciation for him and his regime and what it stood for, they saw him as defending them. They were the, he was the block stopping Iran from uh, advancing and moving, uh, moving westward. Um, there was a cooling off of Arab attitudes towards Iran, but when the United States attacked Iraq, when Israel in the 2006 devastated Lebanon, when it also attacked Gaza, and the U.S. did nothing, and the Arab governments did nothing, you had this upsurge in Arab support for Iran. And so you had a, a situation where when we first started actively polling on this, we did some polling in 2002, and we found that Iran's favorable ratings were like in the 50% favorable, which was pretty good. They weren't 50% unfavorable. They were like 20, 30% not caring. But by the time we got to 2006, in the six countries that we normally poll, here's where Iran's numbers were significantly higher than one would expect in the almost 90% in Egypt and, and, in, uh, and in Saudi Arabia. And the lowest you had was in the UAE, which was, um, which was 70%, but still very high. <coughs> then a series of events began to unfold. Um, you had Iran's ally, Hezbollah, playing a very sectarian game in Lebanon, ordering its, its, its people out into the streets and threatening to use their weapons against the Lebanese government and against the Lebanese opposition, their opposition. Um, you had Iran becoming very aggressive in the Gulf region. Once the U.S. destroyed Iraq, Iran was unleashed and had no counter. Um, there was no big power to check it except for the United States. And so Iran's threat was not just to the United States, but also across the water, and it may end and make noises. I mean, silly noises. Things like uh, if you were flying an Arab airline, if you had a, a country like Qatar that had an Arab airline, that on their map, on their on, uh, in, you know, in-flight map, called the water between Iran and, um, uh, and Saudi Arabia 
called it the Arab Gulf instead of the Persian Gulf. Uh, Iran said that we will no longer allow your, fl your flights to, to fly over Gulf waters or to land in our ports, uh, in, our, in our airports. Um, they never did that with UAE, which also didn't have the water listed as the Persian Gulf, because 500,000 Iranians live in, in the, the Emirates and they depend upon the Emirates for their cash flow back and forth across, not only in terms of trading, but most Iranians have their money invested in banks in Dubai. But they attacked Qatar, they attacked uh, the Bahrainis for doing the same thing, and the Saudis. And so they began to become more of a um, sort of an irritant for some people. The Lebanon situation really bothered people. Numbers started to go down. Um, the involvement in Bahrain, uh, the involvement in Syria, was what I call the, the nail in the coffin. By the time you get to 2011, the numbers are very low. Um, the only place where you get a slight uptick uh, is because of the Shia numbers, which then, their, in other words, their religious allies began to move in their direction while everybody else moved against them. So two things happened. One was between 2006 and 2011, the numbers dropped precipitously, but two, a division between Shia and Sunni in the Muslim world on its attitude toward Iran began to emerge. Let's look at some of the reasons why this happened. First was overall attitudes towards Iran in 2012. Look at the unfavorables and look at the favorables. Only five countries above the 50 percent uh, with 14 countries uh, below, uh, the, above the 50 percent in negative, in negative ratings. Um, reasons for it. First is Iran's role in Iraq. Um, viewed negatively almost everywhere except in Lebanon and Iraq. A note about both Iraq and Lebanon. The reason why Iraq's numbers are going to be high is because 60 plus percent of Iraq's population is Shia Muslim. And Iran, despite their long war and despite the mistrust and despite the bitterness, that many Iraqis still feel for Iran, uh, Iran has worked really hard in cash and in support uh, in many ways to cultivate strong alliances. And as this sectarian division in the Arab world has caught hold, one of the places that caught hold very intensely was in Iraq. Plus, Al-Qaeda, which is a Sunni Muslim group, attacked for years uh, after the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq began to attack Shia targets that sort of fomented even more sectarian division. So Iraq's numbers are going to be very high, favorable to Iran in every one we look at. Lebanon's numbers are also very high, and that's a strange one that sort of confused us because we saw those numbers in, we've done this poll now three times in the last two years, we keep getting the same numbers. So I, I needed to look at it, and as I looked at it and as we did more conversations with people, Here's what we found. While every other Arab country sees Iran through the prism of their behavior in Iraq, their behavior in Syria, their behavior in Bahrain, <coughs> all of the other things they do, Lebanon still sees Iran through the prism of what happened in 2006 when Israel attacked Iran and Israel destroyed, uh, Israel attacked Lebanon rather and destroyed the infrastructure of Lebanon. It cost like a billion and a half dollars of damage in a little country like Lebanon. That's huge. Killed 1,400 people in a little country like Lebanon. That's huge. The Arab Gulf states did nothing to help Lebanon. The U.S. did nothing to help Lebanon. Iran did. Iran not only poured money into the country, but it also sent advisors, it sent construction teams. They didn't just work in the Shia areas, they worked throughout the country. They built very strong ties with the Christians in the country, as well as with the, with the Shia Muslims, and they did work even with the Sunni population. And so when Lebanon thinks about Syria, they're divided down the middle. When Lebanon thinks about Hezbollah, they're divided. When they think about Iran, they're not divided because they see Iran as the country that helped them, the only one that did. You'll see this pattern all the way through. When the Green Movement in Iran, which was the, the anti-government movement that developed after the election, challenging the legitimacy of the election in Iran in 2009, when it broke out and the, finally the, the government came and cracked down and brutally 
squash the demonstrations. Um, we asked people in 2012, how did you feel about that when that happened? Whose side were you on? Almost every country, people were on the side of the Green Movement. In Yemen, they were not. In Algeria and Libya, they were not. Algeria, because it had its own sort of Green Movement that resulted in a huge um, civil war that racked the country uh, about a decade ago. Um, actually, more than that, like two decades ago. Um, and the result was 100,000 dead. Algerians don't like uh, rebellions of any sort because it reminds them of that period. Libya, because they're still going through a whole lot of crazy stuff in the country. Uh, Iraq and Lebanon. Um, everybody else sided with the Green Movement. What the Green Movement did was when we talk about the further decline of Iran, the notion that they were the, the resistance, the rebellion, the revolution, the people's popular movement against the West was tarnished in most countries with the way they dealt with the Green, uh, the green, the green Movement. Iran, Iran's role in Bahrain, again, viewed positively only in two countries, negatively almost everywhere else. Iran's role in Syria, even more so, viewed negatively almost everywhere um, by very, very strong majorities. Another reason why Iran suffered a down. If Iran was viewed as the counter to the regimes that weren't doing anything to defy the West, to stand up against Israel. Um, with the advent of Turkey, which beginning in about 2008 <coughs> or 9, after the Israel assault on Gaza, the big war on Gaza in 2008-9, and the, prime, the then president of, uh, of Turkey went to the World Economic Forum in Davos, and on stage um, got into a fight, a verbal fight with the Israeli president, Shimon Peres. And when Peres tried to defend Israel's position, um, in effect, the president of, uh, uh, the prime minister, rather, of, uh, of, 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 of Turkey said, that's bullshit, and walked off the stage angry. Uh, in the Arab world, it shot Turkey's favorable ratings way up. They said, you see a country that is successful, a country that's the 17th largest economy in the world, a country that is a democracy, um, a country that can stand up against the, the West and defy Israel. And so attention that had once gone to Iran now went to Turkey. And those numbers continued to rise until 2011, when Turkey began to challenge Iran, and so you had the sectarian division, so you now have the reason for a decline is because Sunni go one way and Shia go the other way, and so it's not a uniform attitude towards, towards Turkey, but it's a divided one. Now, on the question of Iran's nuclear program, uh, most Arabs are not favorably inclined toward Iran's nuclear program. Um, uh, and view it as being a weapons program, not for peaceful purposes. Compare this with 2006. In 2006, we said, do you believe that Iran's program is for weapons or for peaceful purposes? This is how many said that they thought it was for, um, for nuclear purposes, for weapon, in 2006, the purple. In 2012, the numbers go up over 50% in most of the countries. Should there be economic sanctions against Iran? You get pretty much a division, but more countries supporting them than opposing them. And again, if you look back to 2006, 2012, in 2006, nobody supported them. In 2012, almost everybody does. But on the use of military, should there be military action against Iran, most countries say no. I mean, all countries say no, except for Azerbaijan. They got their own problems with Turkey, mainly because Turkey calls... Uh, I'm sorry, with Iran, mainly because uh, Iran has a large Azer, um, Azerbaijani population, Azeri population, and the Azeris are, are oppressed in Iran, or, or in any case, the Azerbaijan country feels that, the, that their people are oppressed. But the number of those supporting military action has increased, despite the fact that there still is a strong minority, it's still a minority who support it. Now, 
is it just sect? Was it always sect? And that's the argument that is frequently made in the West, is that, oh, the Arabs just don't like Iran because it's Shia and they're Sunni. But in 2008, very early 2008, we asked the question in every Arab country, who is a leader not from your country that you most respect? This is the answer. It was top of mind. It was completely top of mind. We didn't give <laughs> prompts or anything. We just said, who do you think it is? The majority, the, not the majority, but the plurality, the largest number was Hassan Nasrallah, who's the Shia leader of Hezbollah from Lebanon. After that was Bashar al-Assad, who's an Alawi leader from Syria, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the Shia president of uh, of your, So almost a half, in other words, of the population in Saudi Arabia, which is overwhelmingly Sunni, gave non-Sunni responses. And if you go back to the first slide, almost 90% of Saudis had a favorable attitude toward Iran in the year 2006. So up until 2008, 2009, Iran's numbers were very high and broke across sectarian lines. Now look, in 2012 by sect, favorable attitude toward Iran where they are. Only in Yemen is there a kind of a balance, but in every other country overwhelmingly divided on the basis of sect with the majority of Shia in saying favorable and absolute minority uh, of, of Sunni saying the same. What mutes the antagonism is that there still is, despite the fact that you will have a very strong favorable rating toward Iran among Shia in all these countries, nevertheless, they value their Arab culture as superior to Iran's culture. So there's an Arabness that is stronger than their affi affiliation to sect at this point. That may change in time, but at this point that's where we are. Um, and I think I'll just stop there. What do I do to go back? That was on. Now, what all this says is the following. It says that, number one, we need to pay attention to how Arabs think about Iran and understand why they think about Iran the way they do. Uh, to some degree, I call it the Farrakhan factor. It was it, it, in the 80s, I worked with Jesse Jackson. I was his deputy campaign manager. And we'd be going along. Things would be going really well. And then Farrakhan, uh, who was the head of the Nation of Islam, would come out and say something absolutely terrible, provocative, and infuriating to some people. And he'd get denounced for it. Not only would he get denounced for it, but you would then have major leaders in like the Jewish community demanding, Jesse Jackson, you should denounce Farrakhan. And they'd write letters to Congress, and then you'd have senators saying, Jesse Jackson has to denounce Farrakhan. Um, and, it, and then there were editorials in the newspapers. Guess who benefited from all that? Farrakhan. You know why? Because he became the story and not Jackson. Because that partly was his problem, was that Jackson was stealing all the thunder by running for president and becoming a, 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 a providing a different path for African American leadership to go into electoral politics. And Farrakhan was sort of stuck, saying like, wait a minute, what about me? So he'd say this outrageous thing, and then all of a sudden Jesse would have to be put in a position where he had to denounce. Now, he wouldn't denounce because he didn't want to get into an internal fray and that hurt him every single time. But at the same time, Farrakhan, without saying a word, other than his initial statement, would just be sitting back, sitting pretty, getting editorials everywhere. He'd come into town, and he'd get 20,000 people without a single bit of advertising showing up at one of his, his events. I went to a friend of mine, Ron Walter, who taught at the time, he was the head of the, uh, the Black Studies program at Howard University died a couple years ago and ended up at University of Maryland. He was, they, they, they would call Ron Walters the, the, the smartest black analyst in America. He actually wasn't. I think he was the smartest political analyst in America. He got, he got typed, you know. But this is a guy who, whose sense of politics um, um, was just extraordinary. And I learned so much from him in the 30 years I had a chance to work with him. 
But I went with him. I went to him at the time this whole Farrakhan thing was going on. And I said, what, what, what's this all about, Ron? What, what, why does Farrakhan do this? He said, because he's smart. And he is the measure. He knows that he is the measure of the depth of black alienation from white America. People are alienated from the white establishment. They're alienated from the major organizations. They're alienated from Congress and the Senate. And Farrakhan knows if he can provoke them, if he can get them to denounce him, it works for him. Because he knows that it, on the street, folks are saying, look who's attacking our guy. And it puts Jesse in a bind because he either joins Farrakhan or loses his credibility with the, with the establishment when he's running for president of the United States. It was a very difficult position to be in. That's the game that the Iranians play with the Arab street. They know. That he says something about wiping Israel off. They have no intention of doing that because they know that five seconds after they tried to do it, they'd be dead. And the Iranians are not irrational. They are smart political players who are playing for attention. And so they make an outrageous statement. They make a provocative statement. And they start to get denounced. And the more they get denounced, any of you ever read Marvel comics, the character Sandman? You know, you hit him and he gets stronger. He absorbs your strength. Th that's what the Iranians do. The more you attack them, the stronger they get. First lesson, first lesson, stop the provocations on all sides. The Iranians have to learn one thing out of all this. And that is that it's not working anymore. There was a time when their provocations drew attention to them. Now their behavior is in fact causing people to be irritated. So at one point they were looked at as the leaders, 90% favorable ratings. Today they're looked at as a nuisance and a dangerous one that is provoking problems in Iraq, provoking in Syria, provoking in Bahrain. At the same time, there's a lesson to be learned for the United States and Israel, which is also lower the rhetoric. Because the more you elevate the rhetoric, the more you play into their hands and give them what, they, what the Iranians want, which is to be the center of attention and the source of, of all activity in, in the region. There's a lesson for the Arab governments, too. And that is those Arab governments who treat Shia badly create the conditions for Iran to take advantage of that and begin to deepen this sectarian divide. Right now, right now, we're still in a position where the Arab culture dominates, but pretty soon that will disappear. And people will begin to lose their sense of identity as a Saudi or as a, they probably already lost it in Bahrain, where the repression has been intense. Um, there's a lesson, too, for, um, I think, for, for, for American policymakers generally. And that is that, that what President Obama gets largely criticized for, which is leading from behind, actually works. In, in the, the last slide, the one that I ended up not showing was America's ratings have gone up in the Arab world. And when we ask people why in focus groups, they say, because your president's not as noisy as the last one. People don't like people who threaten boast. They actually like people who lead from behind. I mean, I always used to say about George Bush when he'd say he was the leader, I'd say, but nobody's following. And you can't lead if there ain't nobody behind you. But what President Obama did was a whole different approach, which was talk a little more quietly and work to kind of get people together, as George Bush Sr. did by building coalitions internationally, and it works better. And so America's ratings have gone up. Iran's ratings have gone down. Don't upset the apple cart. The worst thing that could happen right now would be an attack on Iran, because all that would do would be actually the damage, physical damage we would do to Iran, they would more than compensate for political benefits that they would accrue from it, as they would once again become the, the, the defenders uh, against the West, especially because Arab governments would be, not be able to do anything uh, to defend uh, themselves uh, against Iran. And so I, 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 I hope, you know, we, we actually had an interesting run with the survey, and we came out with it a couple months ago, and folks in the administration paid a lot of attention. I did a briefing for the 
Democratic and Republican staffers on the Senate and House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, and been to fora, a number of forums around the country. Um, I wanted to have a discussion, and it's been working as a discussion. You can buy a copy of the survey. It's got a lot of data. If you like data, it's great. It's fun to play with. Uh, it's also an e-book. You can get it on Amazon. Um, but I'd be more than willing to spend time taking questions about it and anything else you might want to ask me. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, we, we've done a lot of polling in Iran, which is not easy to do. Um, and we found two things. One is that the support for the opposition to the regime was never as big as we, we, we wanted it to be. Uh, it was not, it, it, the, the Green Movement was not the majority of the, of the population. Um, it was the majority of young urban elites. Uh, like the Egypt, uh, the revolution against, uh, against the Mubarak government. But um, most people in most countries are, are, are patriotic. Um, and so the degree to which their government is under assault, um, to that degree they will rally around their government. Um, and I, I still think that the best approach <coughs> is the one that the president started with, which was engagement, real engagement. Um, that, um, that tries to win this battle um, by both negotiations but also appealing to the hearts and minds. We've, we've weakened them. There's no question that they've been weakened. But the, the weakening has happened at the expense of people losing benefits. They don't ever, there's never a situation I know of where sanctions like that were applied and people look then at their own government at fault as much as the people who impose the sanctions as being at fault. And so it, 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 it doesn't. And when you've got, you know, as delightful a personality as Netanyahu as your foil. I mean, the interesting thing is that Netanyahu needs Ahmadinejad. And Ahmadinejad needs Netanyahu. But they're playing this ridiculous dance unto death. And a lot of people are at stake in the middle. And including the whole Arab world which is in the middle of this thing as these two guys are you know making boasts and taunting and challenging and threatening and putting the whole region at edge uh, on edge um, and like I said it works it works exactly the opposite as what we want it to what we want it to do so no I, I don't think that their political position has been weakened I mean look at in this next election uh, the good guy, the moderate guy in the election is going to be Ahmadinejad's uh, chief of staff. That's the moderate. Um, the politics of the country have gone off the rails. And, and to some degree, a lack of engagement is, 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 is part of that. Uh, threats over a long period of time have never produced a healthy environment for people to, to make political change. Because there's a tendency then to to, to rally round. Um, and when the young people got their heads handed to them last time, which, which they did, we've seen that movement go somewhat quiescent. It's still there. I'm sure it's still there. But, uh, but not with the force, the vigor that it, that, it, that it once had. Anything else? Come on, someone's got to Yeah? You? You. Um, on your uh, different own person slide, um, yeah. The which, which one? So there were two green lines. So I was wondering if you had... That one. Um, two green lines. Oh, shoot. Oh, sorry. Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> Good one. That's, she picked that out, Jim. You're a creep. Who are you anyway? What's your name? Pay <laughs> for your course. Um, the, um, oh, jeez. Put it up there. Okay, 
No, wait, 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 wait. I'm getting right. I'm going to get it right. Shut up. <laughs> Which one? Oh. Yeah, one's Egypt. Which one? This one is Egypt. This one is supposed to be blue. I will talk to my daughter about that. She designed it. <laughs> this is supposed to be Egypt. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Hu humiliate me. <laughs> you did a wonderful job. Thank you. No, thank you. Good catch. I'll kill her. No, I won't. No, but that, that's, that's, yeah. What, did you have a question about that? Or? Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify uh, uh, what it was. On the Lebanon, I see one was Lebanon and one was Egypt. Yeah. The, the Lebanon one is the sectarian thing, uh, and the Egypt one is, is post-revolution okay. and a, a lot of outreach. I mean, contrary to the, the, re, the reality in Egypt is that um, um, Egypt is a competitor with, Iran, uh, with Turkey, rather, for leadership in the, in the Arab world. Um, Turkey was kind of a stand-in when Egypt was, was down. Turkey was the, we'd ask in, in the Arab countries, we'd say, which country is, is leading? And they'd say Turkey. And then we'd say, which one do you want to lead? They'd say Egypt. Arabs wanted Egypt to come back, but it didn't. So Egypt has come back. I would dare say that this very high number in Egypt right now, as Egypt, if Egypt does begin to come back and you have competition between Egypt and Turkey over leadership, you'll see that number, that number change. Can you, we were talking, I, I can do this. We were talking before about the perceptions of Turks uh, in Turkey of Arabs. Yeah. And of potentially, I mean, you have these powers that could be the leaders. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, the, the, when the Turks got rebuffed going north, they weren't let into EU, they turned their attention south. And they figured, I think, that they would build a political base in the south by becoming the, the essential bridge. And they would then parlay that back into uh, going to the EU and saying, I don't think they ever lost their goal for wanting to be full members of the EU, but I think what they wanted to do was to say, you're not the only game in town, we're going to be an invaluable uh, player. And so they started a policy looking south, first a kind of almost a free trade arrangement with Syria. They opened their border and for trade. And then they'd be very active and engaged in the Kurdish region. I mean, the Turks oppressed the hell out of their own Kurdish population, but became major investors in business in Iraq's Kurdistan. Uh, and also developed strong ties with the Iraqi government in terms of business and trade relations. Uh, they were major investors in Libya. Uh, they were doing stuff in Egypt. I mean, they were doing stuff everywhere in terms of spreading Turkish expertise and spreading Turkish um, wealth and benefiting other countries in the, in the, in the process. Um, they had this sort of mini rupture with Israel because Israel no longer was, an, number one, it was no longer an asset to them. I mean, to the degree that Israel became an inhibitor of their, their relationship with Israel, there had been a point when Turkey looked just to the north when um, Israel, I, Turkey was known as Israel's only ally in the immediate region. And so, and they did, they did what he called the U.S., Israel, and Turkey did these military exercises, infuriated the hell out of Arabs. Um, but there was Turkey doing it. Now all of a sudden, Turkey is doing a lot of stuff in the Arab world, and they said, number one, this is an irritant. We don't need it. Number two, they keep doing stuff that's awful, like the Gaza war, like what they did in Lebanon. So we got to make a stand. So I don't think that the the show in, in Davos was anything but a show. I think it was a real effort to say, guess what? Uh, watch us. Watch us make a, a, a claim, uh, a, a state our position here uh, for the Arabs. And they did. Um, and then they became, after the Syrian revolutions, Turkey tried to play an, a critical role in mediating or negotiating. Uh, when the Libyan revolution happened, they got their heads handed to them by the Libyans who said, you've been dealing with the old regime, we don't want you anymore. Uh, they have to walk rather gingerly in several of the countries because they're kind of in a difficult position. Initially, they tried to mediate the Iran situation, not realizing that most Arabs didn't want them to mediate the Iran situation. Uh, it wanted them on their side, not with Brazil as the mediators trying to solve the thing. So anyway, Turkey 
after a, an initial promising start as being the leader, all of a sudden found itself in hot water in a whole lot of places and not really doing well. Uh, when we did a poll, um, the reverse of this poll, we asked a whole bunch of other countries what they thought of Arabs um, and what they thought of the role of, of, of different countries, what the role of different countries should be. One of the questions we asked in, 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 in all of them was, um, what country, if any, it, should any country lead the Muslim world or should all the nations be equal? The only country where a decisive majority thought that a single country should lead was Turkey. And then the follow-up question to that of those who said, yes, a single country, which country? And now in Pakistan, there were about 30-something percent said a single country should lead. And a, single, a, a, a large number of Pakistanis said Saudi Arabia should. Um, excuse me, a, a fairly good number of Iranians uh, said that one country should lead. They said Iran. and um, Other countries had other, you know, Senegal had like three different choices, something like that. In Turkey, every single person who said that one country should lead, which was 88% of the whole, uh, every single person of those 88% said Turkey should lead. Um, and when asked the question about your culture versus other cultures, most people were, you know, they're like 60 here, 20 there, whatever. Turkey was over, Turkish culture was superior to everybody's. Who made the greatest contribution to the history of Islam? Turkey did. Who, whose culture, who's the more generous? Turkey is. Who's the more knowledgeable? Turkey. The, the sense of Turkish superiority was enormous, came through in this poll. But then we asked another question, and that was, do you know any Arabs? Have you ever been to the Arab world? And interestingly enough, uh, in most countries, people who'd been there or who knew people have a more favorable attitude. Um, I was so shocked when I saw the Turkey numbers that only 5% of Turks had ever been to an Arab country. I read, read the, we did the poll over again, because it was like, what? Wait, this can't possibly be. So it, there were three or four questions like that that troubled me. We redid it this time instead of saying, have you ever traveled to an Arab country, figuring that maybe people didn't know what an Arab country was. Because, you know, in some places in the world, you, they think Arab, they think the Arabian Peninsula, and then there's Lebanon and Syria. They're not Arab, they're Lebanon and Syria. So we asked individual countries. When we added them all up, it came to 7%. That's within the margin of error of the original five. Turks had no exposure to the Arab world. None. And so, it, it, uh, not unlike the United States, right, tromping into Baghdad, having no clue about who they were, what their history was, what their culture was, what the consequences of going in there would be, the Turks were in the same position. They were all of a sudden playing in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in an Arab world that they knew nothing about. They had no personal direct experiential knowledge of. And so they were kind of destined to get in trouble if you don't know what you're doing, as we found in Iraq, with disastrous consequences, I might add. Yeah. Jim, let's go back 30, 30 or 32 years ago, when the rise of the revolution, the Shah, yeah. and he fled, and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came in power. How much Washington really did to help the Shah, who was great leader in Iran in, in the Middle East too. It was very well known. Why he did not do much to help him out and uh, do something with the revolution in Iran to compromise some common good for the people in the Middle East I, and for Europe? I, I actually, I, I recall that revolution <coughs> quite, quite, quite vividly. Um, I mean, people marveled at um, Tahrir Square. But the Iranian Revolution was really quite an extraordinary event. It was nearly bloodless. I mean, other than the fact the military did, in fact, use force. Um, at one point, they just completely surrendered. And the sustained demonstrations of millions of Iranians was a kind of an overwhelming display of popular, uh, of, of, of popular sentiment. Uh, I, I think that, if anything, people were uh, 
if there's anything tragic about that revolution, it's that it was so promising and ended so badly, as many revolutions do. <laughs> I mean, the people who make them aren't the ones who win them. And so the, the young, um, the, the, the urban elite that had a really strong organizational ties um, ultimately gave way. I mean, the initial governments were governments of people we thought we could work with. And we could have worked with them. Um, had no sense at all that this underground movement of the religious leadership would ultimately become so strong and that the Ayatollah would take over and be able to hold on to power as he did. I mean, just like I think people underestimated Hamas in the West Bank, just like they underestimated the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I mean, I was talking to Baraday's people um, before the first election, uh, the first vote on the Constitution. We'll win three to one. They lost four to one. You know, they had no idea how powerful the network that the that the mosque uh, had built uh, through the Muslim Brotherhood, and it was the same in Iran. So I, I think that that if I look back at why the policymakers made the decision they made, um, number one, there was no saving the Shah. I mean, he was a bad guy, and he did bad things in his own country. I mean, the the human rights record that he had was abominable. Shah? Yeah, and people knew it, but but. The, he modernized too fast. The country wasn't keeping up with him. He lost his base. He had no base, actually not lost it. He had no base other than the urban, this kind of the, the, the sort of the professional classes, the, the, those who benefited from the circle of the Shah, whatever. But I mean, the, the demonstrations were huge and the military didn't defend him. And when there was nothing for him but to leave, he left. And we couldn't support somebody who was, who was leaving. Um, and we really thought that Bani Sadr and others would become the, the new leaders in the country. And, and I think everyone was caught off guard that ultimately, um, you know, you'd end up with the Ayatollah and this purge of everybody who wasn't uh, in, the, in the Ayatollah's camp. It was, a, um, it was a great revolution, a bloodless revolution, and it ultimately went... Uh, it went, it went south, and uh, um, I, I can't, uh, I, I don't know much, I can't say much more than that. There, and there was huge bitterness among not just the revolutionaries, but many Iranians uh, over the United States, which is another thing. I think another thing about this whole thing that's pretty difficult, <coughs> I mean, Obama operating with a um, lower profile and less bellicose rhetoric and uh, leading from behind is all good, but the resentment that exists in the Arab world about the United States um, after our policies over the last number of years, uh, despite the fact that you'll have Syrians saying, you should support us, you should support us, you should support us. The first time America bombed Syria, duck. Because the, 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 we are not a welcome participant in this region in the way we would like. We still see ourselves. We, we have, it's like, we're like the, 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 I don't want to be cruel here, but I went to a, a Christmas party at the White House and I was leaving when Liz Taylor was coming. This is Liz Taylor well past her prime. I mean, well past her prime. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm getting my coat and she's checking her coat and she asked for her bag back and she took out a mirror and she looked at it and she said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the ugliest of us all? And looked over at me as if I'm supposed to say, oh, not you, ma'am. But I was speechless because she was totally garish. I mean, with the, the makeup and the work that didn't quite work. Um, but, you know, I mean, there are those of us, I'm old. I look in the mirror and sometimes I say, who the hell is that old guy? You know, but it's it, like. You know, we still see ourselves as the, the shining city on the hill. Ain't nobody else in the world sees us as the shining city on the hill. We lost that one. Uh, we lost it with torture and rendition. I mean, we want to forget Abu Ghraib? People don't. We want to forget Guantanamo and say, ah, you know, whatever, what are we going to do with these guys? People don't. We don't, they don't forget rendition. They don't forget uh, uh, torture, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and Iraq. Um, and drones. 
I mean, these are failed wars. And we're still paying a price for them. And so, you know, in Iran, it was Mossadegh. I mean, you know, people remember when they had a democracy and we circumvented that and overthrew their elected government and reinstalled the Shah. They remembered that. And so, yeah, there were people who loved the Shah, but there were a whole lot of people who didn't love the Shah. And whether or not Jimmy Carter was going to redo the mistake of bringing him back again, I, the question was, we were still in the Vietnam, <coughs> post-Vietnam era. And right now, we're in the post-Iraq era. And while John McCain never met a country he didn't want to bomb, um, thank God he's not president because, frankly, there's not a tolerance for that, right? Not, not only not a tolerance in the rest of the world, I don't think there's a tolerance with the American people. We want, we want wars on the cheap, like, like Libya, where we send a couple of planes, do a couple of bombs or drones, a couple of, you know, robot things like that, like the Serb war that Clinton fought, you know, where you don't put any boots on the ground and nobody on our side dies and you don't have to face the ones on their side who die. Um, and so th this notion that we ought to be doing this and we ought to be doing that ignores the real issues. I was at the State Department during the Syria thing and there were the Syrians saying, you ought to set up a humanitarian corridor. And Fred Hoff, who was the State Department point person on Syria at the time, he said, he said do you have any idea what that involves? It would take 50,000 American troops to set up a humanitarian. Humanitarian corridor means you have to seize territory, you have to hold territory, and you have to administer territory. No, we'll do it, we'll do it. No, you won't do it. You won't do it. We have to do it. I mean, you don't have the capability of doing it. If you did, you would have already done it. But you don't. So you want us to do it for you. But are the American people going to tolerate if we sent 50,000 ground troops into Syria? I don't think so. They would like it for the first week, and then as soon as some Americans start dying, they would say, no, get them out. You know, we just did that in Afghanistan. We just did that in Iraq, and, and it's not working. I, I, I think that there's a sense here that we, we sometimes think, we ought to do this, we ought to do this, without thinking the consequences of what we can do, what people want us to do, and what our own people have the tolerance level for us to do. Sounds easy. But it, it, it's, it's really not. Yeah? Can it not be done with a no-fly zone in Syria? Can it uh, not be saying among all the wars that we fought, I think the majority of the Arabs would support U.S. intervention in Syria. Not, you know, maybe not Iraq back then, but in Syria more so than any other place. I, I, the, the idea of a no-fly zone has been discussed, but the issue is that Air power is only now being used by the Syrians. It was not being used for the longest time. And whether or not it makes a decisive difference in this battle is, 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 you know, remains to be seen. So you know, the question always was, if you used it, what would it accomplish? Um, I mean, Iraq was a no-fly zone for years, and Saddam held, held strong. Uh, I, I, it wasn't the no-fly zone that ultimately defeated Gaddafi. Um, and I don't think it would necessarily contribute to defeating Assad. The bigger question that America is asking right now is, if they win, who wins? Right. And that's what we still don't know. Um, huh? Yeah, who's they? We don't know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I remember when the Iraq war was just, we were debating it, you know. I, I was on the Resolutions Committee of the Democratic Party. I was chairman of the Resolutions Committee and the chairman of the party wouldn't let me introduce a resolution on it. What I wanted to say was, should we go into a war? I wanted to ask the question, should we go into a war who's in a country whose culture and people and history we do not understand, and therefore do not know the consequences of our action? Um, it was a simple question, but nobody actually wanted to ask it back then, because we were too busy beating the drums and marching, marching ourselves off. And I, I will, for the life of me, Never forgive, not just George Bush, but George Bush and the Congress, um, weak need creeps that they are, um, and media. Yeah, media. Media. I mean, I love these guys in the media who now say there should be accountability from the Bush administration. There would be accountability from the media because they never told the truth the whole time. I, in my book, Arab Voices, I quote some of these guys. 
You know, and it wasn't just the, the Fox News guys. It was Chris Matthews. It was Gwen Ifill. It was all of them were saying, you know, we'll win this one in no time at all. And uh, George, you know, George Bush is doing the right thing and the countdown to war. And they were like, you know, it was like it was a done deal. And not a clue. And I did many of those shows. And it's like I used to say they'd know five words in Arabic. And if they could use two in a sentence, they were experts. Chris Matthews, well, uh, what the jihadis and the Salafis. And it's like, no clue what he's, he's a neighbor of mine. I mean, his daughter and my son were best friends, and Chris always wanted them to get married. Um, but, I mean, I love the guy, but he didn't know anything about this. But he just, he's good at running his mouth, and a lot of them are, and I just don't forgive him for it. And I don't do their shows anymore either, because they don't call me, because they don't like to be told that. <laughs> they actually don't. Um, I was on a show over uh, Libya, and he asked me a question. And he said, shouldn't we be doing this? Don't you agree with that? which is a Chris Matthews question. It's a, it's a Fox News and MSNBC both ask the same question, which is, don't you agree that? It's, you know, so it's not an interview. It's a reinforcement of an already existing prejudice. And I said, actually, I don't agree with that, Chris. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, uh, uh, that's not what I wanted to hear. Let me try you. And he went to the next guest, who, of course, obliged by giving him the answer he wanted. Just... It's annoying because lives are at stake when we do this stuff. And so we went into Iraq, not a clue what we were doing. We actually thought, we saw, we have a tendency when you don't know something, you see it through the lens of something you do know. So everything for us becomes Vietnam, or everything becomes World War II, or everything becomes something that we, you know, that you think you understand. So our boys were marching into Baghdad and we saw Berlin, or we saw Paris. So when they said flowers in the street and liberators and whatever, we were thinking Paris. I did an interview um, with a Washington Post reporter who said, what do you think about that? And I said, well, we're thinking Paris, but they're thinking the Mongols. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, why are you writing this story if you don't know what that means? I mean, Mongols were the first invading army to sack Baghdad. They had no clue. We didn't know it. We saw our young boys and girls walking into Baghdad, and we thought of them in one way, but the Iraqis were looking at us in an entirely different way, and we didn't know it. And, and one of the, I mean, I, I did my doctorate in religion. Marwan noted I went to temple, and the one thing I learned is the, the absolute importance of you can never see the world through the other's eyes. But you at least have to know that the other's eyes are not your eyes. And at least ask the question, how is that person seeing me? Because it's not the same way I'm seeing him or that I think he's seeing me. And we all want to think, I, I look really good today. You know, I mean, <laughs> look at this. You know? And, and, and then you don't get attention because maybe you don't look good. But it's like little humility is always in order. It's like maybe it's, it ain't right. Maybe it's just not working. I remember we did the first poll in Iraq in October uh, 2003. And guess what we found? They didn't like us. They were angry. They said it wasn't working. They said that they'd been harassed by U.S. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a pretty picture. I turn on TV three days later, Dick Cheney's on Meet the Press. Great poll done. Zogby, very reputable. He said uh, in a poll, asked them, do they like America? Hands down, we win. They want us to stay, finish the job. It's like, not true. So I wrote this article. They gave it the headline, Bend It Like Cheney. And what I wrote in the article was, <laughs> I wrote in the article, I said, um, he said, it's one thing to fudge intelligence going into the war. It's another thing when you're in the war and your people are dying and somebody comes and tells you it's not working to then fudge that and pretend that it is working. Because then it just dragged on for, for, for nine more years and too many people died um, on all sides. And it didn't work. It didn't work. 
The best scenario right now is that Iraq ends up with another Saddam, who's a Shia Saddam, this time instead of the Sunni Saddam. The worst case scenario is that Iraq splits up um, and becomes a fragmented entity that continues to spill turmoil throughout the whole region. Uh, Al-Qaeda is back stronger than it was when we were there. Uh, the Kurds are feeling their oats and pushing south, and that could be an internal civil war. Uh, terrorist bombs are going off daily, daily going off, killing both Sunni and Shia from each side. And Turkey's become, uh, Iran's become, Iraq rather, has become the, the belt conveying Iranian weapons into the regime in Syria. And Iranian soldiers, incidentally, into Syria. And Iraqi soldiers who are going into Syria to fight for the regime. It's, it's completely a disaster. And we had no clue what we were going to get when we did it. Anyway, that's a different story. I'll do one or two more questions, and then I have one. Somebody? Yeah. I still, uh, uh, the mistake that Washington made, they look at Iran as an oil country. They didn't look at the history of Iran as a Persian, culture, modern, great uh, country in the, in the area. They looked at Saudi Arabia and the other state oil. Mm -hmm. Dollar is coming to us. We forgot Iran for 32 years. They haven't done nothing there. In Washington, D.C. Yeah. So, what really is, you know, we don't want to make the same mistakes. No, I think that, look, I, I, ask, uh, I think. I asked a general, as anyone who was here, yeah. Bashar, I said, General, if today Bashar Assad uh, leaves this uh, the yeah. regime, steps down, who are you uh, depending on? He said, oh, those who are fighting. He said, do you know who are fighting? Mm. Do you know them? He said, well, maybe some we know. Yeah. No, I. I that is a poor I, statement. It, it, a big guy from Washington. And not, not only a big guy, but somebody I respect uh, a great deal. General Zinni is a remarkable person, a courageous person. But he's, if that's what he said, he's, he's, he's totally wrong. Um, and, I, and I think that, that you know, it, it's like, for better or for worse, when, when, when Barack Obama ran for president and he said that he, would, he believed in engagement, I actually think it was the smartest thing. It was one of the reasons I voted for him, was because I believe that engagement, at the end of the day, is the the only way to resolve, a, a resolve an issue. And when he was challenged in the debates by saying, we ought to do, do, uh, engage and tell them we'll engage you, but if you don't, sanctions, he said, no, you can't. Because if you do that, then you know, if you have a threat with the engagement, then you're not really engaging. It, you're really threatening. And he rejected that. Um, but the politics of Washington were such that, I mean, he was not able to pull it off. Um, while he was doing engagement, the, the Senate was passing a sanctions bill over his head um, and forced his hand. The, the bottom line is, is that you're, you're right. Um, do, do I, look, I, I proposed early on in, in this administration, because I didn't propose anything with the last, the last crowd. They didn't listen. Um, I, I thought engagement made sense. But I actually thought that instead of doing the P5 plus 1 that we do, the, the negotiations with Iran, it should be P6 plus 1. We should have an Arab representative in those negotiations to say to the Iranians that, and to say to the Arabs that, because the Arabs' big fear is that we'll make a deal with Iran over their backs. And they have every reason to suspect that that might be the case. They know that Iran is the single largest country in the whole region. They know that. They know that, you just look at the map, Iran is huge and it looms over everything. And it is the Persian Gulf. Whether the Arabs like it or not, that's what it is. It is the dominant culture. 500,000 Iranians living in Dubai. I mean, duh. You know, they're people. Iranians and Turks and Egyptians. That's where the future in the region is. Those are the three largest countries. And they will ultimately, there's a reason why the Ottomans ruled. There's a reason why the pharaohs ruled for, 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 for centuries. There's a reason why the Iranians ruled. They're the three largest civilizations <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the region. Some argue the only civilizations in the regions. Um, we have to accommodate. But if you pose it this or that, you lose. But if you find a way to bring the Arabs into a negotiation with the Iranians, so that there is some kind of uh, operational peace in the Gulf 
with the Iranians not threatening and the Iranians not feeling threatened and the Arabs not feeling threatened, it, it's, it's a win-win. That sounds simplistic, but frankly, it's never been tried. We've never tried it with them. On the Syria thing, it's a disaster from the beginning. And, and I, you know, the, for me, um, the silent victims of the Iraq war were the Christian, the Chaldean community of Iraq. It was the single, huh? Of, 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 of Iraq. The Assyrian, Chaldean, <coughs> there were 1.3 million. They go back almost 2,000 years. I mean, they go back to the third century. Um, they estimate maybe like two, 300,000 left. They're gone. And um, that history is, has, has been lost. And it's the Christians in Syria feel the same right now. And the fact is, is that nobody's paying attention to that <coughs> at all. That there are, I mean, there are people who support Bashar because they're from his sect. But there are others from other sects who are afraid of the chaos that will ensue and don't want to see. They just saw Iraq next door, what happened there. Uh, the, the chaos of, I mean, look, for better or for worse, Syria was one of the, the, one of the great places to go in the world. I mean, it, like Egypt, it was, I mean, I, you, you, they're the only two countries I know. I mean, I'm sure there are other countries like them. But you, you walk down the street, at, at, and unlike Carthage, which you go to, in, you know, which is all underground and it's, some, of it's ren some of it's been unearthed. And, I mean, the ancient histories of Damascus and Syria, and, and Damascus and Cairo, never needed to be unearthed. They were right there on display all the time. I mean, you'd walk down the street and you see an 11th century this and then a, you know, a 3rd century BC that and then, you know, it's all there. And the people coexist with it and live with it every single day. And the danger is that that's all going to be lost. Not just physically, but the sense of place is gone. I mean, Aleppo, those pictures, I saw this picture in the New York Times the other day and it was this street scene. And it was total devastation. Looked like Beirut after the Israeli bombing raids in the Civil War, and it was just devastating. And there's this young guy with a gun sitting on a chair, maybe you saw that picture, in the front with the street scene unfolding behind him. And the caption of the picture was, Syrian rebels score gains. And I said, gains? If this is the gain, what is victory? The total devastation of the country? I mean, it's like... There's some of these things you never win. And this is one of them. There's not going to be any winner in Syria. And I, if, if, if I scored Obama positive for anything, it was resisting all this time becoming an active participant in it. Um, when people who should have known better were pushing him to do the wrong thing, he at least stayed out of it for as long as he possibly could. But the politics are... are um, uh, are, are pushing in that direction. And I'm really afraid that, um, uh, like you said, I mean, we're getting into something where the guys who are going to win are the guys we don't know, and uh, they never work out. It never works out. This, this notion that it's, it's a kind of a, a um, uh, you know, sort of, a, 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 a sort of an apocalypse, you know, or, uh, where you know, everything blows up, and then th this notion that it all settles down just right and pretty, everything works. That is never what happens. When it all blows up, it all settles down as rubble. And it then takes decades and decades and decades to rebuild. And I I'm very much afraid that the problem with Syria is that, um, I, others have now begun to say this, but I, I've said from the beginning that unlike Libya, which what happened in Libya stayed in Libya, except it spilled over into Mali <laughs> a little bit. What happens in Syria doesn't stay in Syria. It's going to go to Lebanon. It's going to go to Jordan. <laughs> it's going to go to Iraq. It's going to go to Turkey. And there's going to be turmoil in that region for a long, long time to come. And what's happened is that Syria's become a surrogate war. It's no, this is no longer the Syrian demonstrators seeking, uh, you know, what, whatever, uh, democracy or freedom whatever. This is now Iran fighting against Qatar and Saudi Arabia. 
and they're fighting over the backs of the majority of the Syrian people. Um, and it's a dangerous, dangerous war that no one will win and everyone will lose. Um, and it frightens me. Yeah. I'm going to ask the last question, uh, unless someone else has a brilliant one. Um, yes, how much my book is? It's $10? $10. We'll, we'll, be selling the, we'll be selling these at the end. But, you know, some of us here are from a <coughs> class on political violence, and we're looking at violence as a... How many of you are in the class? Not all. Not everybody. <coughs> it's a command performance. So... Thank you for showing up. But what I'm saying... But one of the things <laughs> that we've always looked at yep. is violence as a change agent, as a political change agent. We also look briefly at nonviolence, and, and that's, to me, the most optimistic... Or is it, what I'm asking you, is it a possibility in, in the <coughs> Middle East to have nonviolence work? And I think we've seen some glimmers. Tahrir was for the most part nonviolent. Bailin in the uh, West Bank. I, I, Iran, was, Iran was completely nonviolent. So what, what do you think about, can we, can that, uh, do you see a future of, 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 of nonviolence being successful or not? I'm curious. Well, I was going to say, Iran is, was a completely nonviolent revolution okay. in the beginning. Yeah, yeah but, but here's the point. Um, nonviolence is a tool, um, but it is only a tool. And, and just like this notion that violence is all that's needed, um, a big demonstration is also not the answer of all that's needed. Do you ever see the movie The Battle of Algiers? Okay. If you see the movie The Battle of Algiers, you see the, the, the Liberation Front bombing this and bombing that and bombing this and bombing that. And, you know, they're doing their stuff. And then all of a sudden the movie goes black. And then it comes up a couple years later, right? And there's thousands, millions of people actually in the streets demonstrating. And then the French leave. You would get the sense that, watching this, that those demonstrations just sort of happened. But what, they did, what, what you didn't learn was that actually the Communist Party was organizing for years, <coughs> fighting against the Liberation <coughs> Front that was using violence, seeing that as a counterproductive weapon when in fact what should have been happening was building this mass movement for change. The problem in Egypt was that there was no mass movement. The mass movement was the Muslim Brotherhood. They didn't demonstrate. The demonstrations were spontaneous. And then they got larger as people got angrier at the regime's response, especially after the camels came in and started pummeling people. So the kids won this big thing with all these big, you know, big demonstrations and taking over the square. But when it was over, the guys who won were the guys who didn't do anything because they were the political force. Now, I know the guys from the, from the, 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 the April, April movement that were the, the sort of the, the inspiration that who started with the labor movement and started doing the organizing. Um, but, and they now know that their biggest failure was never to build a political organization. They didn't have one. And so when the election started happening, and they thought they'd win, but their only base was in Cairo. Muslim Brotherhood's everywhere. And the mosques are everywhere. And the network of, 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 of guys in the mosques who were either with the Noor Party or with the Freedom Justice Party were everywhere. And these poor kids were sitting in Tahrir Square. They still go to Tahrir Square and they still demonstrate. But that's not where power is. Power is in the streets where you have to mobilize people. So you can't, you can't expect a demonstration in and of itself to win, it's who's got the troops. My, my brother ran for mayor in Utica, New York in 1981. Um, he'd written a book on a small city like Utica, what it does when the industries all leave and the jobs all leave and families start to fall apart because people got to go to Texas for jobs or North Carolina for jobs or whatever. And um, how does a city rebuild itself? Um, so it was kind of an up from the ashes book. It was a brilliant thing for a, a young guy to do. Um, he got the endorsement of the city's two newspapers. We had two at the time. TV station endorsed them. Um, most of the Chamber of Commerce, civic clubs endorsed them. Um, 
And he got completely trounced on election day. Completely trounced. Um, he got like less than 20% of the vote. And uh, the, the machine Democratic Party beat him. So we were sitting there talking one day to a friend of mine who was a former senator. And John was saying, ah, you, know the, you know what they did? They had people driving around picking up old people, bringing them to the polls, whether they wanted to vote or not, and they'd drop them off at the polls. And they gave people five bucks to vote. And they had all, they brought out everybody and they were like giving people marked ballots to the ones who wouldn't read and shown. So my friend looked at him and he said, you got out organized. And my brother said, but, but, but. And he said, no, you got out organized. They knew how to win an election. You didn't. That's why you lost. Best ideas in town couldn't win the election because you weren't organized well enough. That's what it's all about. It's about who's got the organization. And, and I, 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 it's not... I mean, just like bombing Baghdad wouldn't win the war, having a big demonstration wouldn't win the war either. It was it, it, who had the troops and could actually mobilize them. Um, and uh, Romney had more money. Obama had the troops. He won. You can bitch all you want, but he didn't do it fair. They used electronic. That's the new weapon. You know, the new weapon is micro-targeting. I don't like it personally. <laughs> I don't like it personally. It writes off 40-something percent. Of, just like Romney wrote off 47 percent, Obama's people wrote off 47 percent too. They knew who, exactly who to target. They know you by what you buy. They know you by what newspaper you subscribe to or what cars you buy. They know that Volvo buyers or Volkswagen buyers are more likely to vote Democrat than guys who, who drive a Buick. I mean, they, they just, they have all this stuff and it's beautifully done. They know exactly where to go and they win. That's what wins an election. And that's not what wins it in Syria. But, um, but you know, I, I, I th and that's not what wins it in Egypt either. What wins it in Egypt is, who, I, I was in Egypt after the earthquake in the, uh, well, I forget when that big earthquake was. Do you remember when the big one was? Late 90s, I was there, and I was there like three days after the earthquake. I was there for some of the tremors, and um, lots of people died, thousands died, something like that, and whole neighborhoods were destroyed, and I was staying at the Samir Mis Hotel, which is right off Tahrir Square, and the huge government building is, is on the other side of the, of the, the square, and uh, I went over there to see people lined up for blocks and blocks and blocks to get a certification stamped that they had um, had damage or lost somebody because the government was giving them something for it. And they'd wait in line all day and they'd get it stamped at the end of the day and then they'd go to the next place to collect but they were told at the next place that they had to go collect that that stamp that they were closed for the day and they had to come back tomorrow but the stamp was only good for the day that they got the stamp on, so they had to go back the next day and do it all over again. Meanwhile, you went around to the same neighborhoods, the Muslim Brotherhood guys were there just passing out cash. They just knew how to deliver, and the government didn't. And so at the end of the day, the Muslim Brotherhood won. Now, does that mean that they're going to stay winning? I don't think so. But it does mean that that's why they, they emerged victorious. They had a better organization. Um, and um, I think that's it. Thank you Can I very ask much. A quick question? Yeah. What's the role, go back to Syria, of Russia and China in Syria? Russia, China actually has no role. China is like real interesting because they're just sitting pretty, you know? They, we're going to, do you ever read Lenin on imperialism? You should read it because we're going to be fighting that war in the next 50 years it's going to be us fighting China. Because right now you go into Saudi Arabia right now and you go into a, a, an office supply place and look at computers and you'll see like Hewlett Packard or whatever and you'll see like four look exactly the same as the Hewlett Packard one for $200 less but it's the same computer. Because the guy in China who's making 400 of them a month sends them to Saudi Arabia and the Hewlett Packard one sells for whatever Hewlett Packard sells it for, but he just takes the name off and he puts his own and he sells them down there. Um, at some point they're going to say, why the hell should we be making them for them in the first place? We'll just sell our own. I mean, we're going to be competing with them for markets everywhere in the world and they're going to be beating us because they've become our factory floor. 
I mean, these guys who think they're making money sending jobs to China, they're also not just sending jobs to China, but product is being produced in China, which we ultimately do not control. And, and the interdependency is something that the Chinese at some point say, guess what? We don't need this. We got the technology, and we're running with it on our own. Um, and so they don't mind us getting into wars or getting, looking silly. Why should they mind? Because they're our competitor, but they're not spending any money. They're, just, they're winning by having us just look bad wherever we go. So that's them. Russia, on the other hand, um, <coughs> has a direct interest in Syria. It's an ally, number one. It's a port, number two. Uh, they got burned in Libya, number three, when they voted for a UN resolution and didn't realize that the end of the UN resolution was going to be that we would go in and do what we did and kick them out, ultimately end up getting them kicked out. So they're not given anything on this. Plus, they've now convinced themselves, and I actually think they're right in this, that from the beginning that the Geneva agreements that uh, Kofi Annan negotiated and the current uh, Brahimi mission are the right ways to go. That at the end of the day, there has to be a political solution. There's no military win for anybody. And it has to be a phased political solution. Bashar, there, there's, as we used to say in Lebanon, no victor vanquished. There's nobody, at the end of the day, nobody's can win and, and nobody's going to lose. Everybody's either going to win or everybody's going to lose. There has to be a negotiated settlement that creates a phased transition like Taif did. Um, and the Russians, that's their position on this, is partly out of self-interest, obviously out of self-interest, but also out of just a strategic understanding that this is not a war that anyone is going to win. Um, and they also don't want to see it become a breeding ground like Afghanistan was, uh, which was their making. They see the same thing happening there, which is, it's not over. I mean, once this is over in Syria, these tens of thousands of young guys who fought, they're not going to just stay in Syria. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be all over the place doing stuff. Um, and it's going to be a bigger problem. And the Russians, they've already dealt with that in Chechnya. They've dealt with that in Georgia. They've dealt with that in other places. They don't want more of it, you know, and they're trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do we, how do we deal with it? And so I, they have a very different interest than we do. But it's, it's one, I think that in one limited way they're right. Um, in seeing a negotiated solution as the answer. Um, okay. Thank you all. all right, thank you.